experience okay that's what the aim is whether it's me or whether it's the Casimiro's or whether it's Taj or whoever it is the aim is to reach out and affect people's soul and get them to do what's right that's what the idea is and so any way that I can achieve that that's what's going to happen it just continues more and more and for me the thing is to have to find musicians like Taj like Roland Okay, like uh, the Grateful Dead were here a little while ago, a year or two ago. To find these special people and have the relationships with them where I can take my instruments to them and they can play them and show me what they've been developing. And we work together and we reach this thing where it, uh, you know, it just progresses the state of the art for everyone. And so that's what I look forward to, you know. Like now I don't go, I used to go to more musicians, I don't have time to go to that many anymore. But when someone comes who well, I really love their music, you know, I'm going to stop what I'm doing. I don't care where it is, if it's on Oahu or the mainland or whatever it is. If I think I have something that's going to add to their work, their life's work, I'm going to bring it to them. And that's where the state of the art gets advanced. And that's the thing that, you know, some guitar makers don't do that. The factories don't do that. The factories just give their instruments to people to play them in front of people. So they'll manipulate the American minds into going into a store where they'll be and buying them. Okay, the trick is to get one of these guys to buy it themselves. But they want it, and they want to pay you for it. You know, then it gives you the excuse to give them twice as much work as what they're paying for. I'm sitting playing one of uh, Mickey Sussman's wonderful guitars. Uh, these are the type of instruments that uh, you can only find for somebody who's dedicated themselves to a lifetime of making uh, really fine instruments. And uh, they're uh, quite clear, clean, consistent. The wood vibrates. As soon as you play the instrument, you are instantly in love. You want everything that he makes. <laughs> All of them. You know you can't afford it. Oh, but you want to. Ten years ago, they asked me, why did I move to Hawaii, you know? And now they're saying, uh, now we understand why you moved here. But one of the reasons was to, to, to get closer to a music that affected me deeply in my childhood. Um, Hawaiian music, um, I heard, of course, not too much through records, but a lot through programs, radio programs. And, and then eventually television programs where every now and then it would be slid in, and then even cartoons. You know, but they would play it. But there's a, there's a style of playing that people have here and a reverence for the music and the traditions that um, kind of parallels the same kinds of things that I've been doing over the years with um, traditional Afro-American music from the South and from the Caribbean and around. And um, I'm really excited about, you know, being around a bunch of people who really enjoyed it the musical sound. So th this is sort of like my sort of f take on uh, Hawaiian music.
that's why I say it's like I'm out here in the jungle, but then again, I'm not. I'm really not, you know, because I'm really locked into uh, the middle of Waikiki. I'm locked into L.A., and I'm locked into the Bay Area. I got guys in those three areas with my stuff, you know, who continuously come to me and, you know, teach me more and more. Like, that's the thing. I've been taught by the players, not by makers and not by sellers and not by banks. I'm not a very good capitalist, you know. And that's the other thing. I demand a decent wage because I make no profit on the instruments. You know what I mean? I only make my wages. And so they have to be willing to pay me a decent wage, which is a concept that some people can't, they've never heard before, especially some of the wealthy. You know, but I'm not interested in what they haven't heard of. You know, I'm only one person, so there's only a certain amount I can do. And the ones that don't know the difference between what I'm doing, I mean, some people will look at one of my instruments and, you know, ask me the price and just, you know, drop. You know, they don't understand why they're so expensive. And then there's other people that'll tell me I'm working too cheap. So, you know, it's kind of a relative thing. But, you know, thank God that, uh, you know, there are people in the world who still remember where they came from. My name is Lovely Ilima, and when Mickey Sussman introduced me to all his beautiful guitars, he laid them on the floor, and there was this, so many guitars all over the floor in his living room. So it was a really tough choice, which all his uh, guitar making is such a good selection, and I just happened to pick this one, the Millwood guitar, which I picked it up and held it, and it felt comfortable. And when I, when I started playing it, for instance, this song called Kauluvehi Oke Kai, one of my favorite songs, I said, this is the guitar. It felt very comfortable. Me kalan nakila, me kalan nakila. 
Ja. Good night. The pluses and minuses of this guitar, I can go from each neck. Uh, it's easier for me. Uh, the minuses are, or the other pluses, it's mine, you know? Uh, and the minuses is, it's heavy. With the case and this guitar, it's 50 pounds. You know, you have to really, uh, if you're gonna take it, take it. You have to make up your mind. Uh, there's also sympathetic vibrations, which is, that's the bottom neck, okay? Same with this. That's the top neck. So you have to kind of mute these things. Uh, plus my brother, he's another minus. No, he's a plus, he's a plus. Robert, he's a plus. But you know, he doesn't give, you, give me much time to tune or to go from neck to neck sometimes. And so uh, I have to think about, I have to look at the program that we're doing and think ahead what guitar I need, what, what tunings I need, so that when, when it comes up, I'm, I'm already ready for Robert, you know? Uh, that's what this is uh, made for, primarily, to give me more time to play instead of switching guitars all the time. You know, it's, it's quite a big guitar, you know, to move around. Uh, the other minus to some people is that it's intimidating. Good, good. People say, I'm intimidating. I am. Uh, that's because I have a mission in life, to play better music, to uh, put Hawaii music out. Uh, you know, that's why, I, that's why God sent this guitar to me with Mickey Sussman. You know, why he gave me this voice, why he gave me this guitar, uh, the ability to play. I have a mission to uh, spread the word of aloha, the love, you know, aloha. And uh, I'm gonna do that any which way I can with this guitar or without it, but I'm lucky I have it, you know. It's good to have better tools in your trade, yeah? A large percentage of musicians are really sweet people. <laughs> I mean, if you're gonna pick one occupation, I guess any occupation is like that, though. But musicians may be more. They have a, a, a heavy uh, proportion of compassion in their heart that they won't let go. They remember when they were struggling. And so if I bring an instrument that I've sacrificed for and sweated for and has caused me pain to make, I bring it to them, a large proportion of them will look at that and see the pain that went into it and the suffering that it took to create that instrument. And they will appreciate it on that level alone and then they will encourage you to do whatever it is they want. But they'll recognize that, you know, and that's, that, and that's the blessing, really, because you have that interaction. And that's really what, what enables you to strive for what you can never hope to attain perfection, but you just keep working toward it. You know, you near perfection. Honey bee, honey bee, baby, won't you come home to me? Baby. Hear me calling you, honey, come home to me. Where the well, love you, little girl. Honey, I just can't stand to leave you be. Up at five o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. Honey, that's when I lay down my road. Down the road I go. Well, ain't nothing here, darling. That they cry for. You always wonder why a guitar will look nice, and then you get to play it, and it's like whatever it was that they wanted it to be for a guitar is still stuck inside of it. <laughs> you won't hear it. This one, will, this one will resonate. It's just that soul, that's the blood in yeah. your finger, and the fire, the fire and uh, the blood. Yeah. It's great. nothing like Brazilian. No, not at all, not at all. I haven't heard it yet, but I mean, I, they've tried all types of electronic ways of recreating that sound, sorry. Same as the Stradivari thing. That's yeah. right. You know, it's the magic, but you know, I mean, what they say, I've heard it said that uh, 
Skill is a mystery to those who do not possess it. <laughs> you know, so in a way, it's no secret. You know, once you demand the materials, you know, and you put your 20 years in, that's right. Know, then it's really no secret. It's that's just right. it's such a shock that someone put in 20 years learning how to do something right. Yeah, especially you know, that's the, the shock. Yeah, right. These days, wow. Can I get it now? We are sailing. We are sailing to Hawaii. We are sailing. We are sailing. We are sailing to Hawaii. for years. It means something to me. You know. uh, and uh, when I die, you know, I'm not going to go hang it up or go bury it with me. It's going to go to another guitar player. You know, even if it's not my family. If I find a guitar player that plays really well, here, you deserve this. You know, go take it, and when you find somebody else that deserves this guitar, pass it on. You know, it's not going to die with me. You know, it's an ongoing thing to play. You know, otherwise, you know, my, my name won't live on, and neither will Mickey Sussman's, you know, the work that was done. Uh, I love Mickey. He's great. Yeah. So, and uh, fast, medium, or slow. No. <laughs> this canoe is being built for the Native Hawaiian Culture and Arts Program. Uh, in 1989, they needed some big project to involve all the uh, different skills, uh, mine being uh, canoe building, and also involved with um, people making senep, lauhala weaving, uh, uh, food preparation, language. A lot of people are involved with this canoe. So they decided to make a canoe that would bring everybody together. Um, we tried to find some koa in our forest. We tried for six months, but we couldn't find anything big enough. So fortunately, we had uh, Judson Brown, uh, he's um, from Alaska. He donated these logs. The sea Alaska Corporation donated spruce logs to the project, and that got us started. Um, the rest, the top half will be out of core. We already have, you can see the piles of core. We have gotten that already. Um, Every other wood would be uh, native wood, like Ohia. Uh, we have some, uh, the carvings would be out of uh, Milo, Koa, um, no Kawila, but uh, how all native uh, woods, except for the spruce. We plan to uh, sail in 1994. We take it to the Marquesas and sail it back to simulate or, or duplicate the first voyage uh, of when the Hawaiians first came over. The scope of the work is maybe 10 times more than I've ever done before. I usually build uh, racing canoes and these are I would say 10 times larger than a racing canoe in volume and the number of parts. Um, I started with canoes maybe 30 years ago, and I'm, I feel fortunate that I got this project. I'm happy with it, but it's a lot of work. In pattern making, you have, uh, when you're making a, a project, you know, say a piece of machinery, you have to see it finished. So you already visualize the thing, yeah? well, the same way with making uh, models and things like that. Like when we build these canoes, they have no drawings. Huh? You just say the length you want and the width and the depth, huh? that, that's enough. <laughs> we do the rest. You either know or you don't know. <laughs> this is a model of a double hull Hawaiian canoe. And this canoe is made almost exactly like the big canoes that, uh, that they use or they're making <laughs> the hokolea and the and, uh, Hawaii loa, that new, new canoe. And we have to dig up the hull first, shape the hull, then we put on the gunwales, 
uh, before we put the gun rules, we put on the, the this is called the yakus, these things that go across here. And then after that's done, then we put these things on. And then the decking, and everything is tied. There are no nails in the big canoes and no nails in the model here. And it, it takes it takes quite a while to tie one of these things. And then the old Hawaiians used lauhala for their sails, see? And this is uh, lauhala too uh, that I'm using on, on this model. And then they al also had uh, uh, paddles that they used. So when they came to a harbor or a bay or, uh, to land, why uh, they'd pull the sail back and uh, uh, paddle in. And this is, uh, this is real tricky, the way they made this. These cords here would pull, pull the sail right close in like that. And if they wanted to take it down, all they had to do is loosen this thing, and the whole thing would lie down here. Mm. So it was a simple operation. Mm. And uh, then in these compartments, uh, they'd cover the, the, the stormy weather, why they'd uh, cover these compartments. But they carry their food and everything else in the, in, in the hulls here. Mm. And there was uh, this space for them to. Then, you know, for the booms and the masts, so if they were in a storm and got broken, and uh, what they'd uh, do was uh, take the railing off, mm -hmm. and then use that for the mass or the boom or whatever they wanted, mm -hmm. or whatever they needed. Mm -hmm. And then this thing that's in the center here, this long piece here, was to help straight, uh, strengthen the canoe, and at the same time, it was like a track the sail here could move back and forth. Yeah. It all depends on, on the, the type of wind that they were uh, in, you know. Then they'd uh, adjust the sails. Well, when it comes to the design of these canoes, nobody really knows, you know. But they've gotten all, uh, uh, they've found uh, pieces, you know, wreckage of uh, old canoes, eh? and uh, they tried to put it together, and this is as close as they, as they come. Mm. To say that they, it's exactly like the old ones, uh, you cannot say that, mm. but it's something like it. <laughs> uh, I, I don't have any trouble making it, it just uh, takes time. <laughs> there's, there's not much difference in building a, a a racing canoe or something this size. Because when I do work, I, I, I always draw my lines, um, my construction lines, and all you have to do is follow the line. Once you put the line down, you look at it, if it's right, then you follow it. So it's just bigger, it's uh, more work. The, the, the method is almost the same. I know it to float because it's made out of wood. But my main concern is it uh, seaworthy. Um, it involves lives, you know. So if it breaks up in the middle of the ocean, somebody could get hurt or lose their life. So but every time I do anything, I think, you know, is it strong enough? So it might be overbuilt. That's my main concern, seaworthiness. We don't have a whole lot of respect for people who exploit the labor of others, okay? I don't want to dwell on that too much, but uh, I'm not really interested in uh, becoming a cheap labor factory for some bank, and that's mostly what it amounts to. Anyone who's making in a factory, I mean, if you look at a lot of American businesses that call themselves success, they're all paying minimum wage. I don't consider that a success. If they had a product that was worthwhile to produce, and they were doing their job of doing it efficiently, they ought to be able to pay their workers a decent wage. And if they can't, they get no respect from me, and I'm certainly not gonna act like that myself. So I started doing it myself. And, uh, you know, I, I have some apprentices and I have some people that I taught, but you can't expect people to just learn how to do these things overnight. You know, it may look easy what I'm doing, but I've been doing it for 20 years. 
you know. So I, it's not fair to expect someone to do that, and it's not fair for a client to pay someone unless they know how to do what they want them to do. So it's kind of a, you know, it's a catch-22 thing where you can't expect someone to come and work for you for 20 years for nothing, but you can't expect them to do it either, and you can't expect them to pay for it unless they can do it good enough to be worth paying for. So it's a thing where, you know, the system doesn't allow, you know, our American system doesn't allow uh, an apprenticeship kind of program anymore. People can't afford to apprentice. You know, they would have to be either very wealthy or they would have to be so young and not married and no family. But even then, now in the 90s, you know, when, I, when it was in the 60s, when I was learning, it was different. You could live without much money for a while. Now you can't. If you don't have money, you become homeless. You have no medical, you have no nothing. You know, so it's really a sad situation, but, uh, you know, I have to learn to do what I can with what I can. And this is how, I mean, I'm just as angry as I was in the 60s, but this is how I channel my anger. Okay, this is a good way to put it. You know, this is how I maintain some kind of sanity in this world. And I don't just go off the deep end every time I see this obnoxious injustice, you know. So this is my reaction to living in this world.